Last month, Belgian police executed 20 raids across Brussels in connection with a corruption and money laundering scandal involving politicians, lobbyists, and their families, and the countries of Qatar and Morocco, which sought influence at the European Parliament. Multiple people were arrested, including member of the European Parliament, Eva Kaeli, who also served as one of the Parliament's vice presidents. Those arrested also include Kaeli's father, who was detained in a Brussels hotel holding a suitcase full of cash. The scandal, dubbed Qatargate, has been front page news since it broke, thanks to the amount of money involved, the almost cliche details of cash stuffed in suitcases and apartments, and its high profile perpetrators. But if some of us were shocked by elected representatives caught red handed in a cash for influence plot, others were not. I wasn't surprised one bit. Certainly, there's no little or no oversight or monitoring of uh, behavior by MEPs, whether fraudulent or, or ethical. When there has been uh, violations, ethical violations over the years, There's, there's been no punishment. Qatargate, corruption, and unpacking the culture of impunity that exists in EU institutions, and in particular the Parliament, the EU's most democratic body. This is the Speech Bag Podcast. I'm Jonathan Day. Nick Iosa is the Deputy Director and Head of Policy and Advocacy for Transparency International EU, an organization whose mission is to prevent corruption and promote integrity, transparency, and accountability in EU institutions, policies, and legislation. Nick, as someone who works day in, day out on corruption issues in EU bodies, were you surprised by this scandal or was it more like, hmm, told you so? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that having having worked for many years on the political integrity and the institutions and the parliament specifically, uh, I wasn't surprised one bit. Uh, the only surprising element, I think, was the fact that they were using this antiquated method of suitcases of cash. So the brazenness of it all was perhaps unexpected, but not the fact that an MEP is caught taking piles of money to influence lawmaking? No, I, I, I mean, the rules in place... Uh, uh, the absence rules when it comes to issues around integrity and ethics and anti-fraud um, and the management of the allowance system, for instance, has, has been a, a real problem. Um, uh, and so perhaps the scope uh, is is uh, such that I don't believe there's a, been another scandal like it, except for maybe the faux bribery scandal of 2011 for the cash for amendments where a journalist did a sting operation. Um, uh, but Broad throughout the years, ethical violations uh, ha- have been pretty commonplace uh, when it comes to the European Parliament and MEPs. You said that there's a culture of impunity that reigns over the European Parliament. What do you mean by that? How bad is it? Uh, and is this problem isolated to the Parliament? Well, I'm, I must say that it, it, we have assessed the, the integrity frameworks of all the institutions, main institutions, uh, fairly recently, actually. Um, we did a, a, a comprehensive study in 2000. 14 of of the 10 main institutions, bodies, and agencies. And then we redid that, updated that those studies uh, last year when it comes to the three main institutions. Um, and what I think sets it apart is the the, the culture of members. Yeah. So uh, the EU staff, all institutions are are are, are governed by a, an ethical framework that is distinct and different than members. Um, and when it comes to members, uh, what essentially has allowed for the conditions to to develop uh, for this culture of impunity is, well, uh, certainly there's no little or no oversight or monitoring of uh, behavior by MEPs, whether fraudulent or, or ethical. Um, it, when there has been um, uh, violations, ethical violations over the years. There's, there's been no punishment um, for those violations. Uh, in the last legislative mandate, there was 24 ethical violations and, and absolutely uh, no sanctions. Um, and that's because uh, the, the, this self-regulated, self-regulation regime uh, allows for only one person in that parliament of 705 MEPs to, to issue sanctions. And that, that responsibility falls with the president of the house. Um, and so there's been this little gentleman's agreement, much like a lot of these backdoor agreements between the political groups is, my God, what if what if, what if I sanction the SND member now as an APP president? What would happen in 2.5 years when, when you know? So, um, and then 
And then if there are sanctions, because there has been recently some sanctions when it comes to psychological harassment of assistance by MEPs. In fact, one was sanctioned yesterday. European Parliament President Roberta Menzola has sanctioned Spanish socialist MEP Monica Silvana González for psychologically harassing three of her assistants. They don't really serve as a deterrent. Uh, they don't have much teeth. At, at the very worst, and she got the very worst yesterday for psychologically harassing three of her accredited parliamentary assistants, she can be docked 30 days of her daily allowance. Yeah? And that's not her salary. That's just daily allowance. And she won't be allowed to represent officially the European Parliament ex- externally. Uh, but everything else is business as usual. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the rules in place or the lack of rules uh, have also contributed uh, to this, there's this sense of uh, no scrutiny or accountability when it comes to members themselves. I mean, it all this this all speaks to 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 a, a, just a, a ridiculous uh, a set of double standards uh, where MEPs, when we deal with anti-corruption legislation governing 27 member states, whether it be through whistleblowing protection or anti-money laundering or protections of EU funds, rule of law, MEPs are our absolute biggest biggest champions. And when we ask them to impose uh, the same standards on themselves, they're our biggest opponents. And so one is I think that there's a lack of scrutiny because there's a false impression among many, even in this town, that they do have the same standards they're calling on the 27 member states to have. And and the second is that it comes back to this lack of oversight. No one's really watching what they're up to. if, for instance, they have an allowance called the general expenditure allowance. Yeah, uh, it has rules in place on how it must be spent. It's meant for office or representational activities. It amounts to forty four hundred euros directly deposited into an MEP's bank account every month. Cumulatively, of seven hundred five MEPs, it amounts to forty million euros of taxpayers' money a year without one receipt required. There's zero financial management of that of that public money. I mean, can you imagine uh, MEPs being comfortable with Hungary spending 40 million euros a year in cohesion funds? I don't think so. Uh, but that 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 system has allowed to 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 take place for for for, for years. Uh, the financial declarations. I mean, you see you've seen all the travel declarations that have flooded the Parliament administration in the last uh, um, in the last three weeks. Oh my God, I forgot to fill that out, or or my sis forgot to fill it out. And by the way, it's the member's sole responsibility to fill it out. Um, uh, but yeah, there's no there's no monitoring. There's no internal mechanisms to make sure that one the declarations are being filled out and submitted. And two, on the financial declarations, that there's any kind of meaningful level of details to see if there are conflicts of interest. I mean, they can just because MEPs are allowed to have side jobs, um, and and many do, and many make a pretty penny on the side being quote unquote consultants. Consultants for whom? I mean, are you you know a lawyer? Who are your clients, and are you lobbying your your colleagues on behalf of? Um, so uh, I have to say that yeah, I mean this this culture has been allowed to. To fester uh, with with very little pressure ex- externally, um, except for humble parliament, you know, humble civil society organizations like ourselves, um, and and I and we argue is is one of the main contributing factors. This sort of you know feeling of no accountability, lack of scrutiny, culture of impunity that has allowed for the the, the present scandal uh, to take place. This issue of MEP allowances has long been a source of concern regarding corruption, hasn't it? They get rather a lot of money, as you said, uh, outside of their salaries. And I recall several smaller scandals around this issue. Uh, MEPs have four allowances at their disposal. A daily allowance, which allows them to you know, travel to Brussels or Strasbourg and stay in a hotel and eat, amounts to around 340 a day. Um, there is their travel allowance, which used to have a lot of uh, fraud risks in 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 this in the in the way they the, the these were managed, but now it's much better because it's at cost upon receipt. Uh, before there's a lot of lump sums flowing around. Um, there is the uh, the parliamentary assistance allowance, uh, which uh, actually has been the subject of most of the fraud scandals involving MEPs over the years. So this allows them to hire accredited parliamentary assistants in Brussels and local assistants in the constituencies and service providers to do their website and give them media training. MEPs have traditionally used that for personal gain. Yeah, so they've skimmed off tops of contracts. There was a British MEP who spent five years in jail for skimming off the top, Peter Skinner, um, going to Hawaii, buying scuba equipment. 
Another one used uh, skimming off the top to uh, pay alimony to his ex-wife and buy a Range Rover. Um, and then uh, then they use it to subsidize national political parties, which is the more popular way of misusing that allowance. Um, not only in in, the, in in scope, but but the scope of you know the, the the breadth of how many political parties do it, but also scope as in the size of the scandal. So this is the Le Pen scandal, where essentially she used uh, the whole delegation, essentially you know, over a dozen Mammy P's involved, used that allowance to subsidize national political party workers in contravention of the rules. You know, uh, just paying for staff essentially. Um, uh, that has improved, but not enough. There's, there's just not the oversight on how MEPs use uh, that allowance, particularly on local assistance with local assistance and service providers. Yeah, I mean, it, there's, the, there was uh, the, the lifting, the lifting of immunity. There's some confusion before December when the EPPO asked for a lifting of immunity of two MEPs. Right, one was involved in the scandal, and one was not. One wasn't the, the Greek EPP member uh, was uh, requested to lift the immunity because of local assistant allowance issues. Um, this has been a continual problem um, o- over the years, and it, it, the oversight just isn't there yet. And then there's the black hole. Then there's the general expense allowance. Uh, I mean, are they misusing this funds? Who knows? Who knows? Because no one knows how they're spending it except for for MEPs themselves. Are there rules in place on how it must be spent? Yes. Yes, there is. Yeah, uh, there was an investigation several years ago uh, that discovered, uh, based on publicly available records, some interesting, interesting elements of how they they're spending it. Uh, uh, so they're spending it buying uh, by renting space in their political party's headquarters. Uh, I mean, are they renting uh, it at an inflated or deflated price, depending on? Mm, maybe uh, they're renting it. They're renting offices from buildings owned by family members or those, or themselves. Uh, and then there's a lot of MEPs that don't have offices at all. So I don't know what they're spending. But what we do know is that they are spending it because in the last mandate, um, uh, the absorption rate of the general expenditure allowance was 93%. So, yeah, this is one of those relatively quick fixes that I would think anyone would find appropriate that was ignored. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine any public or private entity – that would allow for the spending of 40 million euros without any kind of financial management in place. I mean, my local gas station wouldn't allow for that, right? The night shop doesn't do that kind of accounting. Yeah, so um, to, to, to allow for this scheme to continue um, is, is, is quite appalling. I'd like to discuss how we go about cleaning up this mess. Uh, as you know, the president of the European Parliament, Roberto Mazzola, recently announced a 14-point plan to combat corruption in the parliament. And I want to get to that specifically But I want to ask you first about reforming the so-called Rules Bureau of the Parliament, which I think is something that maybe a lot of people aren't aware even exists. Um, It's the body that lays down the rules of the Parliament. And ironically, I believe MEP Kaili even sat on it. You've been calling for reform of this body for a long time, with no luck. It's the most most Brussels bubbly demand that we have. It's very technical. It talks about a a, a body, uh, an internal body uh, inside the parliament comprised of fourteen vice presidents and the president, and they they sort of uh, uh, govern and uh, make rules that govern the house, um, pass the rules procedure. So um, building policies, issues around ethics. Um, issues around how the member statute is interpreted through implementing measures. It's very geeky. Um, and it's it's our one demand that that has the likelihood of uh, me winning the lotto of getting changed um, because because it's designed in such a way that um, it can it doesn't have any kind of of, of proper accountability. Um, so it, I could paper my my house with the, the number of non-binding resolutions that have been passed calling for reforms on ethics and transparency and allowances over the last couple of years, and not one of them has been actioned by the Bureau. Yeah, uh, Good reforms go to the Bureau to die um, because there is no transparency uh, of the deliberations, um, except for minutes who are, I mean, anyone can draft a, 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 a I mean, you know, there's administrators whose job it is to make sure that those minutes tell me nothing, um, and they, you know, good for them. Um, uh, but it's the political class there. Um, there's no votes. There's no, you know, you can you can pass the buck to whomever you want, um, and um, uh, and that's my concern now. 
uh, that this is what's going to happen with the with the current set of reforms, um, because we've called for a special committee that would be open, transparent deliberations and and um, inclusive. Uh, uh, the direction is, that is taking is is that's not going to happen. It may not be a bureau composition, but it, it could be something similar. Uh, because if you create a, wor- a working group or or task force, there's reasons for it. It's either to kick the can down the road, or or have good ideas die, uh, uh, you know, a slow death. Uh, so um, it, we are calling for in the issues of transparency, uh, integrity, and anti-corruption for the bureau to be stripped uh, of their current powers uh, to 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 make rules, uh, and to have those competences transferred to the relevant committees, whether that's the Constitutional Affairs Committee when it comes to ethics. Whether it's the Budgetary Control Committee when it comes to uh, the allowance scheme and the financial management of EU funds, I mean that's what they do. I mean they look to make sure that uh, EU funds are, are free from corruption and being spent in line with the uh, budget objectives. Um, but they're not doing it with their allowances. Um, they're doing it with twenty-seven member states. Reforming this body and limiting its power on things like transparency, integrity, ethics, there still needs to be the power of oversight of these things, right? But are you suggesting it needs to be an entirely different, uh, a more independent body from the rules body? Political integrity, and particularly around things like allowances, has been my most unsuccessful advocacy campaign out of all of them. Well, I, I've worked on the conditionality regulation. We've worked on anti-money laundering directives. Again, I devoted four and a half years of my life to the whistleblowing directive. And I can't come up with – I can count the wins on my on my right hand on, on, on what I've achieved – with countless hours of effort with myself and a team of people when it comes to integrity and anti-fraud and the European Parliament. So what do we want from the commission? Then? We want them to come forward with a proposal for an independent ethics body, which we have called for for many years. And and I have to say, again, because maybe I've just been in this town too long and I'm jaded, I was very surprised that President-elect uh, von der Leyen and her political commitments, or political guidelines, included this. Now, of course, here we are, in 2023 and nothing's happened um uh, i would i have a number of reasons n- n- number three is why nothing's happened um uh, but it does need to happen uh because what that will do is add a much needed independent oversight uh, to a again self-regulated wild west uh, of members of the european parliament but as i like to remind members, since I've heard a lot of, well, we're waiting for the commission to do anything. All of the rules that govern issues around transparency, integrity, ethics, and anti-corruption are the responsibility of the European Parliament. If they had the political will, they could do all of these reforms all by themselves next plenary session. First of all, of course, these criminal proceedings involving the Parliament are damaging. They are damaging for democracy, for Europe, and for everything that we stand for and thrust. Let me once again assure everyone there will be no impunity, there will be no sweeping under the carpet, and there will be no business as usual. That was European Parliament President Roberta Metsola speaking last month after the Qatargate scandal broke. Recently, she announced a new 14-point plan to tackle the corruption and impunity that exist in the European Parliament. Nick, prior to this plan, Transparency International EU published 10 demands to help the EP clean up its house, so to speak. And I know you've seen the 14 points document, which perhaps unsurprisingly seems rather difficult to do, but are you happy or unhappy? So overall, um, despite my general pessimism, uh, it, it is a step in the right direction. Um, it, it does not least because it it does address some of our longstanding policy recommendations on a couple points that we've been hounding on about for years. Um, so uh, overall, generally heading in the right direction. Uh, but of course, it doesn't address some of the some of the some of the bigger failings. Um, uh, and and those are particularly important. And it doesn't address some of the bigger failings, even on some issues that they could address quickly. I mean, I spoke about, you know, not wanting to have uh, the revision of whistleblowing protection rules in this initial package. But on issues like allowance, uh, they could make a quick change um, that would address some huge 
uh, corruption risks. Uh, they could ask uh, members of the European Parliament to use their existing allowances to hire an external auditor that audits their accounts on an annual basis. How easy is that? Yeah, that would address that would address a huge, huge risk. Um, and they didn't do it. Uh, there's a reason why they didn't do it. Um, uh, it also, I think, generally speaking, it it, it doesn't uh, properly address the process issues that that we are worried about um, in the December resolution. Uh, there is um, a call for the special committee, which we think is very important uh, in 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 addressing any of the reforms that are that are needed. Um, in the fourteen objectives, there's a task force now. Um, will the deliberations be open and transparent? Will they be inclusive? Um, we don't know. But what we do know is that there's no mention of a special committee, and that's real problematic. Um, uh, because again, having worked with working groups or task forces uh, internally at the European Parliament on issues of integrity, we haven't had a great experience. Um, it's it's where it's where people who can't get up in plenary and say transparency and anti fraud measures are are bad um, go go to put pressure on. Yeah, because no one can, no one, no one, and 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 you know, e even our biggest opponents that we've had for years can't get up now and, and say that, you know, we're on the wrong track with our policy recommendations, but behind closed doors, they can't. Yeah. And that's what, that's what our, what our concern is. But on, on some issues, I, I think they are heading in the right direction and particularly around some of the issues around former members, some of the objectives to, to the non-bubble crowd might seem really minor, uh, but, but, to 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 us, actually, they're, they're they're quite significant. So one is post-employment obligations will be put on former members. Um, uh, there's post-employment obligations for EU staff, post-employment obligations for the commission, commissioners. Uh, I mean, more strict ones now that Barroso scandal hit. Um, but there's no there's no post-employment obligations for members of the European Parliament. They even their assistance under certain conditions. Have have a cooling off period, right? <laughs> so, so members members can leave the house um, tomorrow, retire, and and start a lobbying firm, lobbying their colleagues the next day. Yeah, and so all, all within the rules. Um, so that that they aim to to address with a cooling off period that's uh, equal to their transition allowance. Uh, MEPs are allowed a transition allowance, you know, to assimilate back to the real world. Uh, that's uh, from six to twenty-four months, depending on length of service. Uh, and so, this is an objective that we support. Um, uh, in relation to that, uh, they will uh, no longer get a a permanent access badges because they're former members. Um, again, to to to, to the non-bubble crowd, they're like, well, that seems pretty minor. But uh, having been in that building and witnessed the the train of former members having free access to the building to lobby whomever they want, whenever they want, it, it's a big objective. It's it's good. There's also something that really surprised me, uh, as far as the positives go, is um, the fact that um, uh, there'll now be uh, obligations to publish all lobby meetings, not only of all MEPs, uh, but their staff of the parliament, political groups, and assistants. This is potentially significant, is it not? Lobbying transparency has long been a problem in EU institutions. Um, this is quite significant, and I'm waiting to see if this objective uh, come, comes to fruition, to be honest with you, um, uh, because I would have expected these objectives to mostly talk about other people, and they do. You know, uh, third countries being on the transparency register, which it has in there, which we, we support, um, former members. Uh, but I, I didn't actually see there. Was, I, think, I didn't think there was going to be significant obligations on uh, sitting members. Uh, and there are. And that's probably the biggest one. But what we don't have, and we have increased monitoring, uh, increased details on, on declarations, financial interest. Again, all good in the right direction. Time will tell how these, these play out. What about sanctions? We touched on this earlier. It's quite clear that the punishments that members face aren't severe enough to incentivize better behavior. Is there any mention of the sanctions regime in the 14 points? I think perhaps one of the, the biggest, uh, in addition to the special committee, what's, what's lacking is this proper sanctions regime. Yeah? That is something they can address quite, quite readily and quickly. Um, and, and that would perhaps, you know, serve as a proper deterrent for future wrongdoing among members. Um, I mean, 
is anything going to happen to the members that filed their seven travel declarations yesterday for 2020 because they're worried that some journalist is going to call and ask them about it? Yeah. Did they break the rules? Yeah, they sure did. Is anything going to happen? Nope. Not one thing. And again, as I said before, if it does happen, it's going to be essentially a slap on the wrist. Um, so the, the sanctions regime uh, is something that that could be reformed relatively quickly, uh, and they and they fail to do so. Uh, but having said that, I, I think now process is is as important as the contents of the objective. I, I mentioned the special committee. I mentioned the working group. Um, uh, timeline as well and and scope and whether they're willing to tackle the big issues. Uh, what they're going to need to do to tackle the big issues is uh, re- revise codes of conduct, whistleblowing rules, um, allowance schemes, uh, and and I would think that they would want to do this well before the 2024 elections. I mean, this scandal has done immeasurable harm to the reputation of the European Parliament. Um, I know some MEPs uh, would like to think that uh, citizens are making a differentiation between political groups on this, but they are not. Uh, everyone's going to get painted with the same brush on this one. Um, so uh, I would hope they take this seriously with the 14 objectives, uh, because if they're watered, if these 14 objectives, which are a step in the right direction, but I would say relatively meager in, in comparison to what needs to be done, uh, if there's watered down, it, it's going to vote very, very poorly for uh, any kind of big reforms that need to take place before May 2024. I want to pick up on something you mentioned there, whistleblowing. It was near the top of your 10 demands. Why is whistleblowing so crucial here? The one issue that I would argue that they have failed to address that could have helped prevent this scandal was whistleblowing protection, given the fact that there was a number of staff involved, the the sheer scope of how many people were involved. Uh, So the whistleblowing directive, which again, ourselves and many other organizations and MEPs championed for, um, came into force two and a half years ago. It it affords very good protections for employees in the public and private sector. It does not cover EU staff. That's governed by the staff regulation. And the staff regulation obliges each of the institutions, agencies, and bodies to come up with internal rules that afford the, those protections and 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 lay out the details of those protections um, of all of the institutions, agencies, bodies. Not one of them rise to the level of protections of the directive. And of all the institutions, agencies, bodies, the European Parliament's whistleblowing protection rules for staff are the worst. They're garbage. Um, in 2016, there was three assistants who came forward to report wrongdoing, and they were all fired. And then for four years, five years afterwards, no one came forward. Yeah. In the last six months, uh, because the parliament wasn't doing anything, when the Belgian authorities were investigating this, did some accredited parliamentary assistant or did some staff member see something suspicious and failed to report it because they were quite convinced, rightly so, that they would not be protected? Maybe. So you contend that it's at least possible that better whistleblowing protection could have made a difference here? I certainly think that it's possible it could have been prevented if someone saw something suspicious. You know, before the parliament and the world was alerted to this scandal, could they have reported something suspicious and they didn't because of the lack of protection? I, I hypothesize that yes, it's possible. Yeah, given the fact that this isn't just one individual. Yeah, this is an individual. This is members, former members, staff. Um, uh, of of MEPs, uh, the scope has also had questions over s- a staff of subcommittees. Um, so uh, again, it, you have the rules are not in place. Uh, staff know they're not going to be protected, particularly accredited parliamentary assistants if they were report wrongdoing on their on their members. And I simply think that there probably could have been a case where something someone saw something suspicious on a voting list an amendment tabled to a resolution on Qatar in November. Yeah, I got calls uh, from from inside the building saying, yeah, actually, that makes sense now because something was wrong around that resolution, uh, as an example. So, yeah, I would argue uh, that that uh, of all the other measures that we are calling for and of the 14 proposals that the president has come forward with, uh, whistleblowing, I, I think, is is the most closely linked to uh, some of the some of the deficiencies in the framework that led to the scandal. So, just to take a step back, why is the fight against corruption so important? Aside from apprehending wrongdoers, how does more transparency and a firmer stance on corruption benefit our society, our rights, our democracy? 
Well, I mean, uh, from, from, from general speaking, and, and particularly here, I mean, it it it, it gives uh, democracies legitimacy to have proper anti-corruption frameworks in place. Uh, if not, the, the people can't trust the way policies are developed that affect their lives. Um, and that's the case in this present case. I mean, that's, that's clearly uh, evident. Uh, but also corruption, you know, affects so many aspects. I mean, you know, if, if there's not anti-fraud measures in place, can, can public money be used to serve uh, the, the goals that, um, that you want, whether it's healthcare or or public procurement works or education, I mean, it, it, it's all encompassing. Uh, because if if corruption is allowed to, to breed, it, it damages democracy, but also damages society in almost all aspects. Um, and so, again, it, in our small little bubble here in Brussels, I think this is a, a an ideal opportunity to bring back a little bit of trust. Uh, a little bit of democratic legitimacy to the House and to improve uh, standards that should have been improved years ago, but now should be certainly done now. Are you optimistic that this scandal is going to finally force real change? Are these 14 points going to reform anything? Or do you think you'll be demanding similar reform in two years' time? I I could easily, unfortunately, be talking to you in two years' time. uh, Because again, as I said, I've been doing this a long time. I have been continually disappointed. Um, so uh, I'm 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 much more skeptical than perhaps most people in this town as to the uh, ability of the European Parliament to reform itself, um, and that that speaks to a number of, of of different aspects of any kind of reform measures, uh, and it has to do one with commitment. So I, I I'm. I, again, this is going to take a lot of commitment and and sustained commitment from all members. Yeah, it's not just political leadership, although that's where it should come from. Uh, but I, I'm much less impressed with non-binding binding resolutions, uh, very glowing plenary interventions, uh, and 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 good amendments, and then you know let others in some working group decide how the house reform. I mean, MEPs are going to have to of all even the supporters going to have to roll up their sleeves and get involved in the process. Yeah. And the problem with these kind of reform measures, as I've seen time and time again, it wins them no friends. Yeah. And they have to spend political capital to do it. Yeah. It's much easier to rail about Hungary um, and and get get the press interested. So you get political points. Uh, constituents being like, yes, that's right. We shouldn't have Hungary receiving funds if they have rampant corruption and cronyism. Uh, but here in town, it's technical. So the press is interested now, six months, I don't know. Um, So uh, they're going to have to spend political points and they're going to have to uh, irritate their colleagues and peers. Um, And and MEPs have traditionally not wanted to do that. Um, uh, What what I already see is uh, 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 there was the initial narrative from MEPs that they were being attacked by a malign autocratic government without the recognition that it takes two to tango when comes to suitcases of cash uh and now uh there's a there's a mix of um well it's the commission's fault for not coming forward with with the proposal and a lot of whataboutism even from supporters so nick are we really that bad compared to say the european commission well yes i'm afraid you are yeah are we really that bad when it comes to the bundestag I don't know. It's irrelevant. I mean, there's very well-known international best practices and standards that have been developed by the Council of Europe or OECD or civil society uh, that you should be holding yourself up to, not whether your national government is better or worse than what you what you what you have in your own house. Um, so I will remain cautiously optimistic on the 14 points only. Yeah, because that did get uh, broad political support. From the leadership of the house if if any of those 14 though are watered down uh i'll see you in two years even more jaded than i am now that's it for this episode of the speech bag podcast by liberties if you'd like to support our work please consider making a donation for more visit us at liberties.eu This has been a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe. I'm Jonathan Day.